Welcome to the Radical Like Jesus podcast. My name is Greg Steer. I'm the author of the book, Radical Like Jesus. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. I'm the founder and visionary of a ministry called Dare to Share, where we've trained millions of teens around the world how to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Radical Like Jesus is a podcast that's going to challenge you not just to hear the words of Jesus, but to put them into practice, to activate your faith. I encourage you to like this, subscribe, get the word out to your friends, and may we all be radical like Jesus. So glad that Sean McDowell is with us here in the studio. He's authored over 20 books. He uh, is a teacher at Biola. Uh, he's a YouTube superstar. It's where I get my sound truth and sound bites. People ask me, hey, what do you believe about this? I go, let me call Sean McDowell and I'll tell you. Uh, mm-hmm. Solid guy. Uh, and he's a friend. And he's got the best shoe game in town. And every time, I'll tell you this, I've done some events with Sean. You want to find him? Find him in the gym, working out, getting jacked for Jesus. So, Sean, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. That was officially the best intro ever for so many reasons, man. (laughs) Happy to be here. (laughs) So glad that you're here. And, you know, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you know, this is called the Radical Like Jesus podcast. Notice it's not called the Radical for Jesus podcast. We don't need any more of those. We need radicals like Jesus. And you were raised in a family with the ultimate radical like Jesus. How was it being raised as the son of Josh McDowell? You know, my dad really was and is a radical. He's 85, so he's slowed down. But we're talking about being thrown in prison in Mexico for debating Marxists. We're talking about going to South Africa to debate the leading Muslim apologist in the 80s, leading humanitarian efforts. I mean, my dad is all in with the faith. Not perfect, has his shortcomings like everybody, but all in. And you know, whatever family you grow up in, you just kind of think it's normal. Like everybody does this. And I kid you not, Greg, even to this day, sometimes I just assume followers of Jesus will do the same thing. And it's obvious to me. And I'm still surprised that people aren't looking for ways to constantly share their faith. They're not valuing and studying the scriptures. They're not trying to live the life of Jesus. The only way I can say is I just took it for granted. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be an apologist and do this today. My dad never sat down with me once, Greg, and said, son, you should write a book. Son, you should speak. You should follow in my footsteps and do apologetics. And probably if he had, my stubborn nature would have maybe gone the other direction. So there was wisdom in that. But he just modeled it. And he did it, the same on stage as off stage. So I'd see him leave these huge humanitarian efforts that people would see. But then we're down in Mexico, and he had collected little soap bottles from hotels that he traveled in and rounds up our whole family Mm. and says, we're going to put these in little bags, put little love notes with them, and bring them to women who are in prison in Mexico while we're down here. I'm like, nobody knows that. Nobody hears that. And so these things seem natural to me because I had a dad who did that. Man, I, I love that. And uh, I remember just honestly, the first time I met your dad, I was preaching at a Promise Keepers event for teenagers. It was mm-hmm. a one and only teen boy event, 13,000 teen boys and their dads in Columbus. And I look over to my right and there's coach Bill McCartney with his crazy <laughs> eyes sitting in the That's audience. Awesome. I knew him from the, you know, I was, I'm not too far from Boulder, Colorado. So he was that coach. And I'm like, oh no, that's the same look he had on his face when he was upset with a cornerback. And then your dad was sitting next to him and just beaming. And then afterward, uh, he came up to me and he said, hey, would you like to go snowmobiling in Breckenridge this Wednesday? I'm going to be in Breckenridge, Colorado. And I live in Denver, Colorado. And I said, man, I'm booked. And I called my wife. I go, Josh McDowell just asked me to go snowmobiling but I'm booked. She goes, cancel your meetings, you idiot. This is Josh <laughs> McDowell. So I said, hey, can I still come? And he goes, yeah, we, we had a greatest day of conversation, just dropping wisdom like gold nuggets, mm-hmm. you know, just everywhere. And I was running around catching them. And what a privilege that would be. Now, let me just, let me, uh, to be raised in, in a home with a man who, uh, uh, that's the best intro, the same uh, off stage as he is on stage. I love that. So when did you personally, how did you, you know, 
come to a saving knowledge of Christ? I, if you asked me at any point in my life, I would have told you I was a believer in Jesus. I don't remember some dramatic moment at four or yeah. five like some people do. But I would probably say my faith really became my own in college. Mm -hmm. And part of that was in the early, this is like mid 90s. And I got online and I'm figuring out what this new thing called the internet is. And Google wasn't around yet, but I come across this secular atheist web that a lot of its beginning was responding to my dad's content chapter by chapter, mm -hmm. evidence that demands mm -hmm. a verdict. And I remember this is the very first time like doctors and historians and lawyers going chapter by chapter reading this stuff. And it was the first time I ever had the thought, oh my goodness, I could be wrong about this. Mm. And it was pretty unsettling. And it wasn't just a head game for me. It was emotional. Like, what if I don't choose to believe this? What does it mean for my life and my family and my faith? And I had a conversation with my dad. We're in Breckenridge, Colorado, interestingly enough. I think I was, a, I was a sophomore. And as best I can remember, I just said something like, you know, we're not for coffee. Dad, I want to know what's true, but I'm not sure that I'm convinced Christianity is true. And he looks at me and goes, son, I think that's great. And I'm like, did you hear anything that I just said? Wow. And he goes, he goes, look, you can't believe on my convictions. At some point, you have to decide if you think it's true or not. He said, don't reject what you've learned growing up, like some people do in Christian families, just out of spite or rebellion. He goes, only reject it if you think it's false. He said, if you seek after Jesus, I'm confident you'll remain a mm -hmm. Christian because Jesus is the truth. And your mom and I will love you no matter what. You know, something to that effect is what I remember his response. And fortunately, I was at Biola at the time, so I could go to the office hours of J.P. Moreland, wow. <laughs> you know, wow. and some others and just kind of, you know, pick their minds a little bit, read their resources. And so that was where I really, I think before then, if somebody had said, you know, why doesn't someone believe? I'd said, well, they just haven't read more than a carpenter. Like, how hard is it? That was probably the depth of my thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. In college, it was like, dang, I got to really own this. But then I think probably two years after that, I remember I had this experience where we, we, were, we were doing solitude up uh, as a resident director and uh, we were reading this book by Henry Nouwen on the return of the prodigal son. And the narrative in that is that he's, he was a Catholic priest and he always thought that he was like the younger son. Mm. And somebody's like, no, you're like the older son. And it was like this revolutionary moment for him. And I swear, Greg, it was like, holy cow. Mm. I thought to be a believer, I had to have this dramatic mm you know, prodigal son experience. I had to survive war mm. or I had to come out of a gang or, I mean, you've got a dramatic story like that. Like my dad has a dramatic story. These are the stories we put on stage. Yeah. Understandably so. I interview these folks on my YouTube channel. They show the power of God. And at that point, I remember going, holy cow, I'm just as lost mm. as the younger brother because the father had to go out to the older son as well. Mm but he was lost in his self-righteousness and good works and didn't understand the grace of wow. God. And that really for me was like, dang, I'm just as lost, but it's worse because I don't realize it, and I think I'm better than other people. Now, was that the moment I was saved? I think I was saved before. I could point to times where I briefly understood God's grace and believed it was true, but I think that was much more of a decisive point that was like, holy cow, I think this is true. And I am aware of my sinfulness and need God's grace myself. You know, and this is probably a good time. I try to do this in every podcast. I mean, if you're watching or listening to this right now and you don't know where you stand with God, I mean, what a perfect segue. God loves you. He cares about you. Mm. Sin separates us from God. Those sins could never be removed by our good deeds. So Jesus paid the price in our place uh, on the cross and said, it is finished. He was buried and rose again. He offers everlasting life to anyone who simply puts their faith and trust in him alone. And you enter into a relationship with God that is eternal. It starts now. It lasts forever. So if you've never put your faith in Jesus, uh, do so and have that story so you can become a radical like Jesus. You can't be radical like Jesus until Jesus dwells in you. And that happens at the Amen. moment of faith. So. So, Sean, as you think about that, that that kind of began your your radical sounds like a your radical journey toward becoming uh, an apologist. 
Uh, and as you, as you kind of dive into that, um, I mean, you're, I, I just want to commend you for this because, you know, it's what I've told my son growing up when you're, you you know, your dad's an evangelist, you know, your dad's, you know, I've preached to arenas full of all that. And he's, he's seen that since he was little. I used to tell him, Jeremy, I don't want you to live in my shadow, but I want you to cast your own shadow, uh, whatever that means, however God's wired you, um, you have cast your own shadow. You're an apologist, but you you ain't your daddy's apologist. You're you're a different kind of an apologist, uh, still built on this uh, uh, sound you know uh, word of God. But you're not showing up at university campuses and drawing crowds of thousands. But you are drawn literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, through YouTube Shorts. You do sound truth and sound bites, and you unleash these thought bombs that get people's attention and draw, draw people in. And, and you do it in a way that's not abrasive. So, so many apologists mm. are jerks. I mean, I don't know how to say it differently. You are a bold guy, but you're genuinely a kind person. And you actually just wrote a book uh, that deals mm. with this whole issue. Tell us a little bit about your new book. Yeah, this is a book I wrote with a friend of mine who's a professor of communication at Biola. Mm. So he has studied this academically, practiced it at UNC where he got his PhD mm. with like feminist professors and doctoral, you know, advisors. He came to me and was like, he's like, Sean, I've done a lot of the academic work here, but I feel like you're doing this on stage with atheists on your YouTube channel and your life. Let's write a book together. No book is easy. You know that. But this is one of the easiest books in the sense of like, mm. let me just put on paper what I believe and I've been thinking about and trying to do for the past 20 years plus. And so End the Stalemate is meant to give people practical ways to engage in meaningful conversation on worldview and spiritual issues with those who see the world differently. Mm. So cancel culture, what happens, either we as Christians jump on cancel culture and say, you know what, we got power, we'll cancel people. Or we live in fear and we're afraid that people are going to cancel us and so we don't speak truth. Mm. I think there's a way to speak truth but do it meaningfully. And I know you agree with this, but I'm convinced that most people are willing to have meaningful spiritual conversations if we do it in the right way, at the right time, mm. and with the right spirit. Most people are open to this. So it's really a book that's just try to say, all right, Christians, in this crazy political season, and politics matters, vote. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I have a higher goal, namely the kingdom of God that yeah. matters to me more than a particular election, even though clearly elections mm -hmm. have consequences. What if we were to see ourselves amidst other things as peacemakers during mm -hmm. the season mm -hmm. where we just leaned in and listened to people? We try to understand we look for common ground, mm. and then as we can speak truth boldly. I think we've lost the ability just how to communicate with people. And there's a lot of biblical principles I'm hoping to recover for folks. I, I absolutely love it. You know, I kind of stumbled on this idea of conversations, not presentations, engagements, mm. not arguments. 15 years ago, uh, Dare to Share, we did a reality series. I don't know if I ever told you about this called Gospel Journey Maui, where we took a- Oh yeah, yeah we, I love it. We took a Mormon, Muslim, Buddhist, Jew, Seventh-day yeah. Adventist, girl that thought God was a black woman to bake cookies. She got her view from the Matrix or the Oracle and a surfing evangelical named Zane and uh -huh. uh, went to Maui for eight days and had spiritual conversations. And it was literally the very first one on Haleakala the top of Haleakala, after we watched the sun rise above the clouds on that active volcano on Maui, that I asked, okay, is there a God? If so, who is he, she, or it? If not, what do you believe? And I watched everybody begin to open up. And then I watched Zane, the surfing evangelical that who I still travel with. He was like, bro, Josser, you know, you're Muslim, you believe in one God. I do too, bro. His name is Jesus. Emma, you're a Buddhist. You know, you believe in peace. Jesus calls himself the Prince of Peace. I, I watched this guy who he was a former drug dealer with half his brain cells gone, weave this beautiful narrative from listening to every one of their stories and tell them a gospel story in a very kind way. Now, 
throughout the week, we got into apologetics and we taught, we had discussions and disagreements, but we had a relational base and a kindness that was allowed us to be able to do that. And so that really started changing the trajectory of the way that, that I thought about apologetics, but I really believe, what's the name of your book again? It's called End the Stalemate. Okay. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a call here. Uh, we do a radical like Jesus uh, challenge in every podcast that you do mm. in the next two weeks before the next uh, podcast. I'm going to actually ask you, and I have never done this before. Would you mm. go on Amazon and get End the Stalemate and begin reading it and start really engaging in conversations, not just presentations, not just polemics and, and arguments, but in real conversations with those you vastly differ with. So next two weeks, get the book. I'm going to take the challenge myself and start reading it. Hmm. Hey, Greg, let me jump in here. How about this challenge? How about just commit to one conversation? Hmm. Just start there. Yeah. Everybody can have one conversation with somebody. Yes. And a lot of what we talk about in the book is how do you ask good questions? How do you find common ground? If you don't lead somebody to Jesus at that moment, yeah. although that's incredible, it's still a success. You're opening the door to further conversation. Yes. If you do that, just put a little tweet out there. Tag me on Twitter. I, I want to hear it. I love it. Just give us a couple sentences like, here's how it went. Here's what I did. Whether good or bad, it's a win that you did it. Tag both of us on Twitter. I want to see it. And there's, I can't make any promises because I haven't seen your tweet yet. <laughs> But good chance I'll retweet it and just say, here's an awesome example of somebody putting this into practice. Yeah. So I, I love that. Uh, yeah. Begin that one conversation. I'd encourage you as well to get the book. Uh, but let's be radical like Jesus. And let's tie this in with Jesus. I mean, when you mm. think of Jesus, uh, he was, you know, in many ways, uniquely effective as an, as, as an apologist. You know, in what ways do you see the way that Jesus engaged uh, with others, uh, kind of modeling this in the stalemate philosophy. Well, one thing Jesus did well is he didn't just have a cookie cutter plan that he used every single time in every engagement. Mm -hmm. He had wisdom and a sense of figuring out where was somebody at, what was their genuine barrier to faith? And addressing that barrier to faith. So the woman at the well is very different than how he engaged the rich young ruler, which is very different than how he engaged, say, some of the religious leaders of his time in the early chapters mm -hmm. in, in John and elsewhere. So that's the first thing to realize. Second, Jesus did two things that effective apologists do. Number one, he told stories. Right, Some of the best apologists of our day, people like Lee Strobel, mm. right? amazing books, but he tells a story about his life. He tells a story about the person of Jesus and just draws people in. That's what my father's been doing for mm. this fall, actually, is six decades of ministry. Wow. He tells his personal story, and it captivates people. So good apologists tell stories. When somebody raises an objection, you can... I can say, here's three, four, five, six responses, or I can say, let me tell you a story of how I see this played out that carries the response within it. Mm. The other thing Jesus did is he asked questions. I mean, you know this, Greg, but if you take the Gospels and Acts, there are 340 questions that Jesus asked, mm. 340 questions. The letters of Paul, there's 262. Wow. So the God who made our brains, and I've been studying this. I recently had a chance to interview a Jewish talk show host, Dennis Prager, and I've been reading his commentary series yeah. on Genesis. And it's really amazing how he just points out that even in the beginning, God with Adam and Eve, who told you that you were naked? He asked mm. questions. So if the God who made our brains engages us through asking questions, then let's ask others questions. So tell stories, ask questions, find out what the root of the barrier is for somebody. Mm. There's a proverb that says the purposes in a man's heart are deep and a person of wisdom draws it out. Yeah. So if we practice those three things and Jesus also, I mean, he was just brilliant with logic. Some people think Jesus just kind of float around and talk to kids and carry to sheep and told stories. Jesus was brilliant 
I mean, he split the horns of a dilemma, logically speaking. Mm. He was a real intellectual in ways he doesn't often get give credit for. I agree. And, um, you know, you look at the way he dealt with the woman at the well. I mean, ask a simple question. Can I have a drink of water? Leads to the living water. Um, <laughs> go get your husband. I don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and the dude you're sleeping with now is not your husband. She shifts. Actually, she shifted the subject to apologetics. She's like, well, you Jews mm. say we should wish him drew some bit. We believe it's this mountain. And he went right. It was what I call soul apologetics, S-O-U-L. He got right behind the barrier, mm. right to the sin area. And she wanted to jump to a, an actual apologetics debate because she was convicted in that moment. Jesus was brilliant. You know, it's it's interesting. What I see, Sean, as a barrier for a lot of people when it comes to evangelism is they don't have a cookie cutter approach, right? They don't know where mm. to begin because they don't feel brilliant. They don't, they don't feel like they're Sean McDowell or Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel or Jesus. So what we do at Dare to Share is we use a kind of a, a modified approach, ask, admire, admit, ask a ton of questions, mm. get to know what they believe, admire what you can, find common ground, and then admit the reason you're a Christian is you so desperate you needed Jesus to save you. And then we have a gospel acrostic. We have to memorize uh, and be able to articulate. And what my conviction is, is, is it's like playing a guitar. Uh, you don't just pick up the guitar and start playing. You can't play the apologetist guitar like Sean McDowell or Jesus the first time out. So you need to learn the chords. And once you learn the chords, you can put it together. So kind of get that that strategy to engage. And then over time, I think the Holy Spirit and maturity gives you more skill to be able to turn any conversation, anytime, anywhere, you kind of flow in and out of it. It's like learning forms in Kung Fu. You learn it. And it's like that scene in, you know, a uh, karate kid, you know, you practice, practice, and then you're able to kind of throw all the moves out mm. when Mr. Miyagi calls you out. Right. And so uh, learning that strategy, but then, really getting maturing in that to, to where you're as you're radical like Jesus in a sense, in the way that you engage and you're able to move in, in and out of those conversations. Most people don't start there. Uh, but the problem is most people don't start. So we start and then we begin to make our way toward that. And I, I really, I want to commend you for mm. your YouTube channel uh, and what a blessing it is because you really model this whole, you know, end the stalemate, let's have a conversation. Tell, tell us a little bit about some of the people that you've brought in to have conversations with that you are totally different with and how that has affected um, those people as well as your, your listeners as well as you. So I've had on a, a lady who described herself, this was her term, she said the OG lesbian YouTube content creator. Mm. Been on YouTube 12 years, creating the kind of content that your audience and mine, you know, would take serious issue with. We had a wonderful conversation. I brought on some agnostics, a uh, few atheists, some progressive Christians, interestingly enough. I've done a trip recently to a, a Hindu temple and just had a conversation with a, a kind of guru who was there. Went to a mosque recently and had a conversation with an imam. Mm. And I brought my son. We just got a tour, just asked him questions, but building a relationship. And uh, he's coming to my apologetics class to have a 90-minute conversation with my students. So some of these kind of conversations, you just build a relationship and they take time and you stay committed to them and you know you see where they go. But I think one of my favorite conversations is with someone who's now a friend of mine and he describes himself somewhat tongue in cheek as an atheist New York media elite. Mm. And uh, he's written for New York Times Magazine, New Yorker. He told me, he said, Sean, I have never organically met an evangelical. Mm. I mean, let that sink in. He's my age. He has a son who's roughly the age of my son. And he grew up in Greenwich Village in Manhattan, which is the root of the sexual revolution yeah. and the LGBTQ <laughs> movement. And the irony is we're about the same age. And my dad was probably the most outspoken critic of the sexual revolution going back to the 70s and 80s and 90s. And now we're friends. 
And what was interesting, Greg, is we were having a conversation. He asked me, he said, can we do a show on, can we share a country together? And I'm less interested in that question, um, but I'm interested in it because it was interesting to him. And I'm like, sure, let's do it. And we were talking about just how torn up both of us are just about how divided and polarized our country is. And we kind of got to the point where he said, you know, this, I don't remember if he said it or I said it, but the point came out of like, this affects him so much more because mm -hmm. as an atheist, this is all he has. There is no life after death. And I was able to say, I'm torn up about our country, but my hope is in something so much deeper mm -hmm. than the next election. And I said, so why don't we write a book together and we'll just go point counterpoint. We'll take the trans issue. Maybe we'll take race. Maybe we'll take politics and faith. We'll just take the thorniest topics. And I also want to talk about faith and weave Jesus in there. I've got to, you know, I'm an apologist and evangelist and he's willing to talk about it. And just in a relationship of people who care about each other, mm. let's dialogue back and forth where we can speak truth and hopefully model for people what this looks like. And I'll tell you one more thing that's really interesting, Greg, is I said, man, my folks at Bio will love to have you come on campus. My president would love the idea of an atheist professor who comes on campus and we have a conversation and we interview him and see how he sees the world. But he's been very frank twice. He goes, yeah, my group of people will be, let's just say, less enthusiastic to have an evangelical. You're basically one of the ha most hated groups mm -hmm. in the world in which he lives. And yet he's willing to take that risk and bring me in maybe to speak to different audiences that I wouldn't have a chance to speak to. And so I'm just praying for love and for wisdom, how to do this and for boldness in this. And it just reminds me, you know, people watching might be thinking, all right, I don't have a podcast like Greg Steer. I don't have this incredible story like Greg. I'm not an apologist like Sean. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Everybody can find someone in your life yeah who's open to hearing more. I mean, when Paul speaks on Mars Hill, there's one group that mocks him. There's a small group of believers. And then there's some people who say, Paul, we'll hear you more. Find those people mm. and keep going. Keep the conversation going. And you'll also learn a lot of your blind spots. He sends me feedback af after a lot of my videos and just to see how an atheist views this stuff. Sometimes I'm like, huh, I didn't really think about that. Mm. Like, it's just awesome to be in conversation with people who see the world differently because we will learn some of our own blind spots and hopefully communicate even better. You know, Sean, as you were talking, I had a middle picture when I was 14 years old. I drew a little sketch of a stadium uh, with me preaching to him. Uh, Billy, Graham was my, <laughs> Billy Graham was my hero and I wanted to be the next Billy Graham. But I heard a statistic from Dr. John Maxwell in my, I think my early 20s. He said, even the shyest person will influence 10,000 other people in their lifetime. And now I still have that sketch. I have that little notebook in my office. But when I look cool. at it, I don't see me. I see an eighth grade girl. I see a 10th grade boy. I see a 25 year old, uh, you know, construction worker. Uh, I, I see a lawyer, a doctor speaking to the 10,000 people they'll influence over the course of their lifetime. So I look, everybody's filling an arena with the number of people we're going to influence. And so you are an evangelist. You are an apologist. The question is, are you engaging or are you enraging? Uh, and so mm. really encourage you to engage, not enrage. And, uh, Sean, this has been this has been great. Do you have any last thoughts, uh, final challenges? You know what? My last thought is that I'm going to steal that line, engage rather than enrage, <laughs> and I will commit to try to give you credit. I might forget where I got it steal in it. due time. I absolutely love that. Love what you're doing with Radical. Greg, I'll tell you, I saw a tweet by you a while ago that was something like a 10 or 12-minute Uber ride leads this guy to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I read that. I'm like, dang, that hasn't happened to me, man. Holy cow, this is possible. 
So you're out there like kicking my butt all the time, telling me to get more bold and more radical. That's why I endorse your book. That's why I'm on here. You know, we're friends for reasons beyond that, but just want you to know, I appreciate that about you and keep going. You probably didn't know when you sent that out, you would encourage me, which brings me back to my atheist friend. He was mm. watching my stuff for a while before I even knew it. Mm. And I was like, why do you watch my stuff? He's like, you don't freak out. You have a conversation with people. And that kind of seems to imply that there's a confidence that's there that's intriguing mm. to me. Mm. And so if 10,000 people you influence, that's 10,000 people watching all of us live our lives yeah. every moment. So this is more for myself than anybody else. Let's live differently. Amen. Let's model what we say we believe, and then our words are going to have a lot more power. Amen. Amen. So uh, as we wrap up, it, you know, where, if people want to follow you online or your YouTube channel, where, where are the best, what's the best uh, way for them to follow you? Well, my website links to everything else and it's got a, a weekly newsletter that I send out, but I, I post a couple of videos a week on YouTube. Just did one with Dennis Prager, Jewish response to like genocide, polygamy, mm. slavery. Like it was so interesting. I've got topics on the resurrection and issues of sexuality. Uh, I'm on Instagram, post almost a video a day, just quick video responses, trying to equip people. I'm on Twitter slash X. Uh, so probably the website would be the hub to connect with everything else, but I, I don't send out stupid cat videos. I really, now and then I try to do funny and fun personal stuff, but for the most part, time is short. I just want to equip and motivate people in their ministry, just like I know you do. So it's seanmcgall.org or .com? .org. I think .com is maybe a sportscaster, okay. so that would be a very different experience. Sean McDowell, <laughs> S-E-A-N, org. Yeah. You got well, it. Sean, this has been great, man. I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate your example and uh, keep, keep, keep on keeping on and uh, may God use this for everybody tuning in mm. to really encourage you uh, to be a better apologist and to have conversations um, with people. So thanks again, Sean. Thanks, brother. Love you. Love you. Thanks for listening to the Radical Like Jesus podcast. We hope you've been inspired and challenged to live out your faith boldly and passionately. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend who needs some encouragement. Also, we'd love to connect with you. You can keep up with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at at G-R-E-G-S-T-I-E-R. Remember, you can find Greg's new book, Radical Like Jesus, now, anywhere books are sold. Until next time, keep doing those challenges and stay radical like Jesus.